This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 96. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. First, before we get started, let's talk about our great sponsors. 1791 Gun Leather is the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, and they'd like you to know their appreciation for the Second Amendment fuels their passion for gun leather and its representation of the original patriots of this great nation. 100% certified American steer hide joins four generations of professional leather artisans to create the perfect firearms holster. Carry your firearm with pride knowing that each 1791 gun leather holster is handcrafted to be the best holster for your firearm. See their full product lineup at 1791gunleather.com. The supporting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast is Hodgden Powder. Available in granular powder and pellets, Hodgden's family of 777 powders gives muzzle-loading enthusiasts a quick-cleaning, low-odor black powder substitute for rifle and pistol applications. To learn more, visit Hodgden.com. Yeehaw, partner, we got a great roundup today as we talk cowboy action shooting. Okay, sorry about the cheesy intro, but cowboy action shooting does tap into the inner Wild West, residing in every red-blooded American, male or female. Our guest today is Alan Garbers, one of the writers here at Guns Magazine, and somebody who's completely ate up with cowboy action shooting. Alan gives us the inside scoop on what it is, how it's done, and how you can do it too. Now here's Alan Garbers and Cowboy Action Shooting. Well, good afternoon, Alan. Good afternoon. Actually, kind of short notice, I was uh, casting around for something to talk about this week because we've been working on some other projects, and I just happened to stumble across a, uh, a picture guy all dressed up like a cowboy, and I thought, cowboy action shooting. And who do I know? And I thought, well, I know a lot of folks that do it, but I think the guy that, when I talk about the topic and comes to mind, I know you are completely ate up with it. I I thought you would probably be the guy to talk to, so we'll just talk about cowboy action shooting. That's not a problem. People will say I'm ate up (laughs) on on many topics. (laughs) What the heck is cowboy action shooting for folks that don't know? Well, it is basically a game or a sport, depending on your outlook on it. Uh, People that like to use Old West style guns, you know, stuff that was basically designed before 1899 and use them in, uh, I guess you consider four gun or three gun competition. And some of us enjoy dressing up part of it, too. So it's just basically you're living your childhood, you're, <laughs> you're channeling, you know, your John Wayne or Roy Rogers or, you know, whoever you want to channel for that day, you know, that's what you do. So you go out, you dress up the part, and then you go in a shooting match and you get to shoot Old West style guns. And if you're, you have one ounce of American male blood in you, it's pretty cool to watch. So I've, I've, I do not participate, but I'm always fascinated by it. So. We've got that out of the way. So how did this whole thing kind of get started? Well, I'm not totally clear on the beginning. I know it's been around probably, I mean, Fast Draw has been around forever since mm-hmm. the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s. And then people got together in the 80s. Uh, sometime in the 80s, a group of people, and I think their name, and I got the p- people at SAS, please forgive me, but I think the original group was called The Wild Bunch. Uh-huh. And they decided, hey, this would be a great you know, game to play, a great sport to get together and play cowboy or play cowgirl or saloon girl or undertaker or you know, whatever profession you wanted to act like you were. Uh, and they just started doing this. And I think it started in California or actually some of it started here in Arizona mm-hmm. uh, in a place called Cowtown, I believe, down by uh, northwestern Phoenix. There's, there's a shooting range down there. If I remember right, and don't quote me, <laughs> I think that's where this started, or a part of it started. And then they they heard these this wild bunch heard about it, and they wanted to do something similar 
So they came up with these rules and regulations and started doing it. And in the 80s, it just blossomed. I mean, it, it just blew up, basically, because you had all these these um, uh, baby boomers that had grown up on, you know, all the Westerns in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And suddenly, you know, they're at the age where quite a bit of their kids are now gone. And so they have spendable, you know, they got some folding money in their pocket. So they said, hey, you know, we got money to do this. Let's go do it. So it just really boomed. And, it, and of course, it isn't just men, it's women. You know, they like to wear, you know, it wasn't just guys dreaming about being cowboys. <laughs> it was women dreaming about, hey, I get to dress up in fancy dresses and, you know, and all these other things. And so it just it just exploded. You said SAS, and that's the Single Action Shooting Society. I, I at least knew that. But explain what is SAS. It's kind of like the, the big daddy of this, this sport. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest organization out there. Um, like you said, it's the Single Action Shooting Society. So it's basically a conglomeration of a whole bunch of clubs that are across the United States and around the world. I mean, there's people over in Germany that do it, people in Australia. Uh, you name it. If there's a country and they've been watching Bonanza somewhere, <laughs> they're probably got a a, a a club somewhere. I mean, if you get online, you can see where people from Italy are enjoying it, people from France, England. You know, they're, they're everywhere. They they enjoy doing what we're doing and dressing up. So it's it's just that you know, with SAS, SAS laid down you know rules. So it's kind of like any other sports you know there's set criteria and set rules so when you get together you, you go across the country you know what the rules already are you already know what the categories are so it's just like um like a guideline and, and a club so you can go anywhere and participate and and be, have fun you you talked about you said it's kind of like three gun with it you corrected yourself and said it's more like four gun and i, I at least know that much explain uh how the matches work and the kind of shooting you're doing and why we we might call it four gun. Well, it's four guns because you're using four guns. You're using two pistols, a rifle, and a shotgun. Um, so it's kind of like three gun, but it's you're you got a, an extra pistol in there. And all the pistols have to be a uh, single action, hence the name single action shooting society. And then uh, the rifles are uh, both not bolt action. What am I saying? That's the BAM. Uh -huh. uh, they're, they're lever action rifles. And then uh, the shotguns are uh, usually side by side. That's what I use. And then uh, since the Winchester 1897 was invented in 1897, that is also allowed. So anything prior to 1899 is allowed, provided it's not a safety hazard. Was there, you know, the Winchester 1893 is not allowed because there was safety issues and some of the Marlins were not allowed because there were safety issues. But anyways, what the match involves is you have uh, generally uh, on, a, on a local level, you have six stages on a, at a day. And those stages are made up of a scenario. You know, a person reads off a scenario and then you shoot a sequence of targets and ever changing each stage they change and you shoot both pistols which would be five shots each for safety you don't have one underneath the hammer when you start and then you shoot your rifle so that's 10 rounds and then usually your shotgun is four rounds or more so it's usually the the standard sequence these days is 10 10 4 so if you see a bumper sticker that's 10 10 4 that's probably a SAS member that's just got that little thing uh, to, to identify themselves as a SAS member. Ah, little secret sauce stuff there. Exactly. Um, and then so you, you, you shoot it, you, you shoot the, uh, the uh, stage, you're timed, and uh, your time is your score. And if you have a miss, that's five seconds added to your time. And if you have a procedural, like you have brain fade, like, you know, I do, and you shoot the targets in the wrong sequence or you use the wrong gun at the wrong time. Because when they give you a stage, they say, shoot this first, you know, shoot, you know, this gun first, this gun second, this gun third. And if you mess it up, like we have a tendency to do, then that's called a procedural. So that's an extra 10 seconds added on to your time. 
So at the end of the match, after your six stages, your times are all added up, and that's your total score. You know, as as you uh, compete, you can compete in different categories. There's age-based categories, and then there's equipment-based categories, and then there's costume-based categories. So you pick one, and it gets confusing when you look at the uh, – the manual, the SAS manual, that's that's the hugest, the biggest question of new people coming in is, I want to do this, but I don't understand the costuming. You know, do I have to wear this? Do I have to use this? Do I have to do that? So that is the hard part. Basically, if you're a newbie and you want to come in, shoot an age-based categories. That way it's easy. The cost, you know, you just have basic. You have to wear, you know, if you're a guy, you have to wear a long sleeve shirt, you have to wear long pants, and you have to wear closed toed boots that are not tennis shoes or combat boots. You don't have to wear a hat. You, you know, you, you, it's very, very easy. Anybody has the basic stuff already in their closet. Ah. But now, if you want to, once you get into it and you see, her, you know, everybody, all the older guys, or I shouldn't say older, all the veterans that are doing it, they like to make it you know their own and they like to dress up and that's what i do i compete in a costume category and my category is classic cowboy so i'm required to wear the six items off a designated list those six items have to be on my body the whole time i'm competing and they're not hard things i mean it'd be like a, a kerchief i have to, i can wear cuffs spurs um chaps chinks um, a, a watch with a fob, a vest, you know, things that make you look more cowboy like is what is required for the classic cowboy category. And then your guns have to be 40 caliber or larger, uh, caliber wise. And your rifle has to be made or designed prior to 1880. And, uh, yeah, and your shotgun as well. I'm sorry. Your shotgun has to be made before 1880. So the shotgun can't be a Winchester 97. So it has to be a side-by-side or the Winchester 87 lever action. So, and then if you wanted to be like Roy Rogers or uh, Dale Evans for a woman or a guy that's, you know, uh, uh, feels that he can, uh, <laughs> well, you know, uh, yeah. see where I'm going with this. Yeah, I know. Identifies yeah. as Dale Evans. Uh, <laughs> those guns have to be, uh, uh, made after the, the rifle has to be made after 1880 and then they can use the Winchester 97. Ah. So, so like for me, I have my guns, my rifle could be the, the, the uh, Henry 1860, the Winchester 1866 or the Winchester uh, 1873. Those are the models. If I want to shoot B grade Western, then I can dress up like Roy Rogers and hop along Cassidy and all that, all the bling, you know, all the yeah. cowboy bling. Those guns have to be after it. So like the Winchester 92 and then some of the Marlins, Marlin uh, 94, I think, and that kind of stuff. So and, and then like classic cowboy, you can't wear the uh, the low slung holsters. And in and, and the uh, B-grade Western, you can wear this low tied down holsters, you know, and look cool and yeah. and have all the bling and all the rivets and all this. All the you know, everything, you know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's basically it. You just you 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 can take it as far as you want. You can do the minimums if you want. It's just how much how much you want to do with it and how much fun you think you're going to have. Sure. And if you're completely ate up with it, like maybe Alan Garber's. But well, let's get back to the shooting. What I've looked at is the shooting's not super challenging. It looks like it's mostly steel most of the time. And it's, it's not, you're not doing a lot of distance shooting. It's, it's more about, uh, it looks to me more about speed. Is that correct? Yeah, it has the, 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 when SAS first started out, when Cowboy Action Shooting first started out, it was, the targets were farther away and smaller and a little bit more challenging. Um, as time has gone by, most of the matches or match directors clubs have found that people like to go faster. They're all about speed. So they like to have them, you know, big and close. Mm-hmm. You know, we sometimes joke that they're so close that if you had bunt lines, the barrels would be touching your targets. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's how it is. So yeah, the targets are 
there's there's uh, SAS has laid down it has the minimum sizes on the targets, no maximum sizes. So if you go to a I'm going to use Border Town. That's down in uh, Tombstone here. That is a hugely popular uh, state match that usually sells out in a matter of days because people have so much fun because the targets are so close and they are so big. You know, it, let's face it. When you get older, your reaction times slow down. Your eyesight's not that great. So taking time to to aim and point slows you down just as you get older. It's just a net, natural fact. Right. Border town, everything's closer and bigger. So I've been down there one time to do a monthly match, and I got to shoot the targets that they normally shoot. And I did. I, my times were faster. So I felt like a rock star because <laughs> here I am 10 seconds faster than I normally am. Because normally for me, you know, a 60 to 35 second stage, you know, 60 seconds more common, 35 is less common. Everything's got to be right for me to get a 35 second stage. Mm -hmm. If I was younger and better at this and I could practice more, there are guys that are doing stages in 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 17 seconds, and they're just so crazy fast. I was going to say, when I'm do I was doing my research for this and looking at some videos, some of those folks, and, and like you said, they're all young folks. Uh, I saw one one kid, he was 15, and he was shooting his single action so fast. I'm not sure you could shoot a semi-automatic as fast as he was shooting a single action. It was crazy. Yeah, you might be talking about Matt Black. I know, I have never met him. I think that's I, who it was. Yeah, he is crazy fast, and I have been told that he is fast enough. He can actually outrun a semi-automatic because you got to have that cycle time in an a automatic, so you got to wait for it with the with a single action using two hands, he can actually operate it faster. Yeah. And so that leads us in, uh, talk about the pistols first. You got to have two of them. They got to be single action. So uh, there's probably not a lot of folks that are shooting original single action armies, are there? Um, there are some. I have met some uh, back when I lived in Indiana. There was a guy that shot with two uh, Colt Bisley, which are single action. They're, they're, basically just a, a slightly modified version of the single action army made specifically for target shooting. He had two originals and he was using them. And there was another guy that I knew uh, that he was shooting a uh, Colt single action army first generation. Wow. So there are people that do that. I probably will. I have one at some point. I probably will shoot it just in a, in a match one stage for one time, just for the fun of doing it because there, there is another guy that I shoot with here. He has uh, originals. He has Winchester uh, originals, and uh, he shoots them in a match. So, you know, he's not only has a piece of history, he gets to play the piece of history. Wow. But to, but to go back to your original question about the, the pistols, there are so many Colt clones, you don't need to use a, a real Colt. I mean, to be honest with you, these days, Colt prices have gone up to the point where the average guy can't afford them. I mean, you're looking at the manufacturer's suggested retail price on a Colt single action army, but they are still being made. It is roughly $1,900. Good luck finding one for that price yeah. in this current market. You can go get a good used Colt clone made by Pieta or Uberti for 500 bucks, if not mm -hmm. less. I mean, there are more expensive versions out there, but you can, you can, if you would just want to get in the game, you can get them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably the most preferred and used uh, pistol out there is the uh, Ruger Vaquero. You have the original model, and then you have the slightly smaller framed new, what they call the new Vaquero. Those are built like tanks. I mean, uh, Bill Ruger did a fantastic job of making them basically bulletproof. So that, if far and away, when you go to a match, I'm going to say 75 to 80 percent of the people are shooting Rugers. That's what I shoot. I've got four of them, and if I could get two more of a certain particular <laughs> uh, length, I, I'm actively looking for them. They don't make them anymore. I want a seven and a half inch stainless steel ah. new new uh, Vaquero and 45 Colt. They're they're a rare bird, but if I find them, I'm going to buy them because I want one. <laughs> and that's only the the only reason you need. Yeah. Yep. When I was looking at some of these videos, and again. 
uh, that young man that just uh, smokes those those guns had to go back and do a little more research and it looks like uh, there's a lot of modifications when you get to that kind of level uh, folks are, are doing what they call half half stroking and uh, lightened springs and and talk a little bit about that which I know that's a whole topic in and of itself but you pretty much got to do some work on the guns right yeah i mean when you get to the nationals which is end of trail or a regionals or a state level you're attracting the, the top people and you know i knew a guy back in indiana that he was one of the top top guys and he went to end of trail and there was uh over the entire course there was like less than a second between him and some of the other shooters, shooters time-wise, and that's over the entire the, the entire match. Hmm. So you're talking, you break that down into a series of maybe you know 16 to 18 stages. You're talking, uh, you know, fractions of a second are are the difference between first place and second place, or third place, or not even placing at all. So people are looking for an advantage to you know shave off those seconds. So they short straight, like on a pistol, instead of the full cock back, it'd only be a partial cock back. Um, they'll put lightened springs on it so it doesn't take so much energy so you can run it faster. That's the whole idea is run the pistol faster. And, you know, they'll get their little technique where they'll be, sh- you know, most of them are the, the fast, fast guys are doing two-handed shooting where they're shooting, you know, they're pulling the trigger with the right hand thumbing the hammer back with the left hand you can see that on some of the videos if you get online that there's there's a lot of you know how-to videos and they'll show you that kind of stuff and so that's what they're doing is they're lightening the springs shortening the stroke on a pistol and smoothing things that's another thing too smoothing everything out just to make them get that shave just a little bit of time off and of course the ammo is uh downloaded because you would not be shooting a full house uh, 45 Colt as fast as that young man was. No, no, he's probably actually uh, he's probably actually gone down to 38, uh-huh. uh, 38 or, or you know 38 357. And when I'm not talking about 357 Magnum loads, I'm talking case size. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, we have they call it, some of the guys do go real low on the power factor. I mean, there's another thing on SAS. They have set criteria on what the maximum velocity can be and what the minimum power factor can be. So on the big matches, they'll actually check that kind of stuff to make sure, A, they don't want you damaging their targets with too hot a load. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they actually want to keep you you know, corralled in power-wise so you're not just going crazy. Because you know, some of the guys talking about you know, mouse fart loads because they're so <laughs> tough. I, I have been to matches where some of the guys I can't hear the gun. I have earplugs in, but I can't hear their their rifle firing. Wow. All I can hear is the steel ringing the target. Huh. They're that low of a power. And to yeah. me, I, you know, I, I would probably want to check those guys to see if they're actually making the power load. And then, of course, you got the guys that are they're getting squib loads because they're making them. You know, they're not watching their powder charge. Well, sure. they're, they're so close, so close to being at the bottom that the bullets aren't even making it out of the out of the barrel. Wow. So that that's a, that's a, that, at that point it's a safety issue. Yeah. So on the rifles, um, they're not using rifle calibers; they're using pistol caliber uh, levers. I, I think I saw where like the eighteen seventy three uh, Winchester is a very popular one. Yes. So you know the uh, when when lever action rifles first came out, they were all pistol style caliber guns. So the you know, when he, I think the Henry first came out, it had like a forty four caliber it was a very short cartridge if i remember right and then they went to the 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 66 which is basically the same caliber and then when he went to the 73 that's when winchester came out with their their dash calibers like so you got the the uh, 3220 the uh 4440 the 3840 so those were while they're technically made for a rifle colt turned around and actually put them in pistols so People could have, you know, people in the frontier could have both guns use the same type of caliber. So while technically the 4440 is a rifle caliber, it's not considered a rifle caliber anymore. Right. So, but yeah, that's it. You got it. You can't use the 3030 
or a, a 35 Remington or anything like that as your main match gun. It has to be a pistol caliber. So th- probably the most popular one is the 38 Special slash 357 because uh, it's cheap to reload, it's cheap to get brass for, and it's you know it, it's almost no recoil whatsoever. So you can run them really really fast. And some guys like me, I I have 38 357 for my wife Diana to use, or if I have a guest over they can use those and that i have been going to 357 cases just because some of the rifles you have to if you're going to use 38 you have to pull the bullet out a little bit to make that overall length that'll actually run in that gun so if you go to a 357 case you don't have that problem you can just put the bullet where it's supposed to be and it it'll run you know it'll feed through the rifle correctly yeah and then if you go up to probably 45 colt is the next most popular and that's what i run is a 45 colt uh is it's it's a straight cased uh a cartridge just like the 38 357 are and it's easier to reload you don't have the the i have 4440 stuff and it, for me it's just a little bit of a problem at times reloading the 4440 because the case smells are so thin that I'll crumple a case and have to start over again. So 45 Colt just takes that headache away for me. Yeah. I just thought of something backing up uh, to the pistols. So it sounds like most of the top end competitors are using that 38, 357. Is anybody shooting 45 Colt? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, most of it is for speed wise is, I mean, your equipment only gets you so far to, to gain speed. You need to practice, practice, practice. And you need the biggest thing to practice is your transitions. So, you know, when you're pulling one pistol out in competition, the other one needs to be going back in. When you're putting the other pistol in, you know, the the last pistol in your your holster, you need to be already reaching for your rifle. When you're done with your rifle and setting it down, you already need to be reaching for your shotgun. And you need to get all that stuff down where there's no wasted movement. You know, be moving as, you know, as your, as your, as you're going through a stage, most of your gun, your, your guns are probably not going to all be right in front of you. They're probably going to be scattered in, in the bay. So you're, you're going to have to be moving from this table to this table to this table while you're transitioning, while you're still dealing with your, your empty gun. So all that stuff shaves time off, and that is the biggest time saver. That's not something I've conquered yet. It's mm-hmm. something I need to conquer, but that is the biggest time saver is learning your transitions getting your shotgun uh like i shoot a, an externally hammered shotgun so i have to cock the hammers while i'm breaking it open put the two shells in and then you know close it fire recock it again because it's four or more on shotguns and then you know do do the whole thing so that's that's where the times the true time saving is once you get past that point then then you're st- you're shaving off seconds you get past that point, now you're saving off tenths of seconds. Well, moving away from the guns, uh, talk talk about these costumes. I was doing, again, a little research, and when I saw the uh, the Beaverfeld hats that were six, eight, nine hundred dollars $900, I thought, I probably wouldn't get started with those particular hats. No, uh, I'll admit, I got a $600 hat, but I got it when the place was having their they're one week a year. They have a half off sale. Ah. <laughs> so I got it for 300 and some dollars. So it's technically over $600 hat. But so I do have one. I do not wear that in competition because I, uh, here's the thing, a lever action rifle, especially the Winchester style, love to kick the brass up and over your head and on top of your hat. Mm-hmm. Every time that happens, it makes a little black mark. So yeah, when I'm in competition, I am shooting with a, a hundred i have a hundred dollar hat so that's my competition hat and it's got little black marks all over it so you can get crazy with it because they do have the bigger matches they do have costume uh competition um so people you're you're right they flat out go crazy with it and they they get an all matching outfit and they you know and they they get the polished boots and and all the the accessories to go with it from opera glasses to you know, spurs, spur straps, cuffs, you know, kerchief slides, the hat bands, you name it. 
uh, you know, if, if there's a way to fancy it up and make it just a little bit more blingier, somebody's doing it. And it's the same with the ladies, too. You know, they got the, the and I'm, I'm not going to get the name right, but there's like a satin type cloth that's, you know, shiny that they make their dresses out of. And then some of them go with, you know, little more provocative costumes that show off a little <laughs> bit more flesh. And, <laughs> and, you know, they'll get jewelry. You know, some of the women will have jewelry made out of the cases, you know, the, the cartridges. Yeah. And they'll have, you know, their special hats and, you know, and the, the decorations in the hats. And, you know, of course, everybody wants custom holsters that, you know, says, hey, this is me. This, this, this is what I do. So, yes, they re- people really, really get into it. And it's that basically the sky is the limit. You know, whatever your budget can handle is is what people will go for. So me, I and I, I guess I should go into this a little bit, too. I enjoy NCOWs. We don't have an NCOWs group out here. I would like to start one. But NCOWs went for, goes for authenticity. Ah. If you can't prove it didn't exist prior to 1899, you can't wear it or use it. SAS is, you know, SAS is a fantasy game. So SAS allows um, steampunk. I mean, that's, oh, wow. when you when you look at the movie uh, with uh, Will Smith, uh, Wild Wild West. That is a classic steampunk western. Yeah. I mean, the stuff that's in there never really existed. The, the stuff is so far fetched, but it's fun to watch, and people get into wearing that stuff. So they'll have. There is no steampunk category shooting wise, but there is steampunk costumes, and you know, so people will go all out. You'll see them. It'll it'll look cool. I mean, uh, you you'll, you'll think you're in a Jules Verne novel mm-hmm. or something when you're seeing all our stuff. So. They'll they'll just take it to the nth degree, and 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 me I like authenticity. So I have books that I that I have that show original cowboys from the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, and that's what I try to emulate is what I see in there. So I you know if, if I wear a pair of cuffs, I and they're probably ones that I, my pair of cuffs I made, but I made based on what I saw that originally existed prior to you know, 1880. And when I get a pair of boots, I want them to look like they did back in 1880. So, you know, no stitching on the toes, uh, no stitching on the sides. You know, it's, it's all authentic. Try to, I try to go authentic looking. Yeah. So that's what I'm into is, is, is my fabric correct for the period is, is the, the, the style correct for the period. Yeah. Other people do not take it to that nth degree. They just want to have fun. As long as they look cowboy like, they're good. Well, I'm I'm actually a little familiar with uh, like Civil War reenacting, and I know typically a person will pick an, an actual person and interpret their life, uh, what they wore. You know, they'll be versed in their backstory, how they would think and talk and act. Is that the same thing, or is it just more about looking the part and then having fun shooting? It depends on which club you're at. Um, SAS, you're probably not going to find out a whole lot. I mean, people will have, we have our aliases. So somebody might pick somebody in history to have their aliases, and they might try to emulate that person, look, and probably know some of the history. Um, if you get into NCALs, they actually have their originals category where these people will study, you know, they will pick their costume. They're, they're, I won't say clothing, costume, but it's more like they'll pick their clothing and they'll pick a, uh, a persona and then they'll actually develop their own, you know, uh, backstory based on history. So then if they want to be part of this group, they have to develop all that. And then they go in front of their peers and they're quizzed by their peers <laughs> and, and made sure that, Yep, you got it right. You did your research. Your, you know, the, the the history that you're giving us would be authentic to the time period. Your costumes authentic to the time period. Your experiences that you're relating are authentic to the time period. So you have to do all that. So I mean, that, that's very very serious uh, for that category. I mean, there's people that that it's just like the Civil War stuff. I mean, you get people that are you know in the Civil War stuff and the pre 1840 stuff. They are concerned with the width of the stitch on their sewing. You know, right. Their costumes have to be hand sewn. 
their costumes have to have the stitching this far apart. You know, the cloth has to be correct. It can't be Dacron or, you know, or wool blend. It has to be the right stuff. Yeah. So, yes, NCALS does, can take it to that, in, that degree. SAS, I have not seen that. As it's, they, you know, they'll t- most of the people tell you, this is just a fantasy game. You know, we're not, most people aren't going to be into it that, in that manner. Ah. Well, I know, again, Civil War folks, uh, the term I've heard is Farby. I don't know if that goes over into the cowboy, but that's basically somebody that's uh, not not hit the mark in terms of authenticity. Some of the guys, I mean, will go to the point of they spend the weekend at a, a, a reenactment or an encampment, and they'll sleep on straw in a shelter half and basically live as they did. And, you know. There's all sorts of different folks that, you know, some would rather just go back to the hotel, but there's guys out there, you know, in the in the cold and rain, sleeping on straw and uh, living as they did and in that particular case in, you know, 1863. Yep, yep, and that's how it was back when I used to do rendezvous there. You know, you I slept in a tent, and I tried to keep it authentic as I could. Um, you're probably not going to find that at a SAS match. I mean, generally, you know, I'm getting older. Let, let me put it this way. Most people at SAS are over 50. The vast majority are over 60. Ah. So, you know, we got our aches and, and, and pains and sleeping on the hard, cold ground <laughs> isn't going to cut it because somebody's going to have to help me get up. Yeah, yeah. that's That was in the back of my mind when I was talking yeah. about all that. So, I mean, we got we got our 10 teepees. We got our, we got our you know, our class ARVs and our fifth wheels and you know, our air conditioning. We go back to, you know, after the end of the match and all that stuff. So, yeah, we're, we're not going to be in it like that, uh, that much. But, you know, a match just is just for the, the day, and it's usually over with. The state matches and the national matches, they run for days uh, at a time. But I don't recall ever seeing anybody in a tent or a teepee or mm-hmm. anything like that. Not saying they couldn't, uh, but I've not seen it yet. Yeah. You know, one thing I've seen in, in talking to folks and reading on it is everybody says the same thing. You you need to go to a mat if you want to get started. You need to go to a match and kind of observe. And part B of that is everybody is really excited about having you, and they will do anything they can to help you get moving along. So, having said that, if somebody's listening and says, you know, it's time I do this, how how should they get going? Well, like you say, they the first thing they need to do is go to a match. Don't buy anything, but that's the big. This is this is what I did. I wanted to join. I've been wanting to join SAS for for twenty five years, ever since I first heard about it. But because of you know a financial situations, raising kids, all that kind of stuff, I didn't have the folding money in my pocket to buy. You know, to, let's face it. You're probably talking by the time you get through buying leather. The guns and and the clothing, minimum you're you're looking at probably three thousand dollars, and it can go up from there because you're gonna want you're gonna need reloading equipment as well. If you're not already a reloader, you're gonna need reloading equipment because you do you're gonna be going through hundreds of rounds of match. You know each 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 day you per month you go you're gonna at minimum you're gonna need is probably 120 rounds plus your shotgun, so it adds up. So the first thing I would say is go get on SASnet or find SAS on uh, Facebook and find a c- local club as they are across the United States. There's multiple SAS clubs everywhere, like where I'm at right here in Yavapai County, Arizona. We have three uh, SAS clubs within driving distance, you know, short driving distance. So go to one, watch what the people are doing, look at the gear that they're using. Ask questions. If you come dressed appropriately, there'll probably be somebody willing to shove a gun in your hand and say, let's let you run through a stage just so you get familiar with it. Because the very first thing I did is I had preconceived notions, and that's the worst thing to have. Hmm. I knew that this I needed this, this, and this before I could even go to a match. And then I got there, and I realized as soon as I got to a match, I saw the guys that were shooting classic cowboy, and I said, that's what I've been wanting to do all along. I want to do the classic cowboy. I like the name. I like how they look. That's what I want to do. Well, I had the wrong caliber of guns. So while I don't mind buying new guns, that's another huge investment I had to make. Yeah. 
to 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 buy you know as much at that point diana said hey don't sell your other guns because i'm going to want to use them when i go with you so i was like okay well i gotta buy two more new pistols another new rifle and another shotgun <laughs> so you know go to a match see what people are using and then see, you know, don't just go out and and willy-nilly buy stuff because there are i'm not going to say any manufacturers names there are some guns that there's no matter what you do they're not going to run fast lever action rifles yeah there are some pistols that aren't the greatest quality that will you're going to be frustrated with them so you know ask questions see what other people do get on sasnet that's uh, it's, it's sasnet.com i think correct uh, get on there and and you know get in the forums ask questions see what's for sale see what you know you'll see when you see somebody offering some guns and everybody jumps on it you know that's a good gun because everybody wants it. If a gun sits there and nobody wants it, it's probably a reason why nobody wants it. Yeah. So, you know, don't like I say no pre no preconceived ideas. Go see uh, and that go from there and then have fun. You know, go into the idea that this is a game. It's you're you're not competing for anything. There are no prizes other than maybe a belt buckle or or uh, like a wooden nickel or something like that. <laughs> and you know, at the big matches, they give out belt buckles. The smaller matches, if you have a clean match, they might give you a wooden nickel. And that's it. There are no, so there is no reason that was done that way on purpose because they want nothing to stop the best competitor from helping the worst competitor. Yeah. So when you're new to a match, the guy that can run a 10 second stage, he has no problems coming over and helping you but it's not going to affect him whatsoever. But there's nothing, nothing, you know, to be won other than, you know, you're trying to beat your own time. You're, you're not going to win a Cadillac. You're not going to win a pickup truck. You're not going to, you, you know, you're, you're not going to get a sponsorship from somebody. So it's, you're just there to have fun. You're there to come back for the camaraderie, for the excitement of shooting guns that you don't normally see in competition. You can shoot older guns. Uh, like I said, the other guy, he has a 73, uh, musket, Winchester 73 <laughs> musket, which is very rare, a super long barrel on it. It is so cool when he brings it to the match and plays with it. Cause it's just, you know, you're seeing history in action. Uh, you, when you see a guy using a real Colt or I tell you what, you see people really using Winchester model 87 shotguns, which was the gun that the Terminator used in the second Terminator movie, if you remember him yeah. going on the Harley where he's twirling around and blasting locks and all yeah. that kind of stuff. That is an actual cowboy shotgun. That is very popular because uh, it's a lever action shotgun. And there are reproductions that are being offered and people still swap. You know, they scoop up the originals and still shoot them. Uh, and then the Winchester 97s are extremely popular. They were made from 1897 to sometime in the 1950s. So those are very popular. So it's just, you know, go, go to a match, see it, have fun, uh, and, and make friends. Well, as we're getting ready to close here, I got to say, everybody's got a name, right? Talk about yes. that and, and your name. Well, my name is Choya. Um, I, I like cacti is one thing. And then I also saw the movie with Alan Ladd. Um, I think it's the name of the movie was Branded where he was uh, actually trying to get into a ranch, uh, uh, posing as the long lost son of the rancher. But that was his, his actual name was Choya. And he just was, you know, acting like he was the son trying to get to the fortune of the, of the, uh, of the rancher. But yeah, I mean, you can pick people's names can be something crazy like a lead dispenser. That one's kind of <laughs> obvious. Um, they can be um, uh, Rooster Cogburn, or you know, if you're trying to emulate, you know, some movie star, that, you know, or or a character, or something like that, you can do that. Or if you know of a person in history, like a relative, like your great grandpa, or or uh, uh, like Wyatt Earp, or, or you know, or some people might modify it to Wyatt Burp, or, or you know, something. <laughs> they'll do a little something weird with it, just to make it their own. And so you're busy. They don't allow staff actually keeps track of the aliases and they will not allow you to claim an alias identical to somebody else's or that could be mistaken for somebody else's. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just something that 
to have a, a little fun with, you know, you get to be, as I, I saw a meme on Facebook the other day uh, where somebody had said, you know, do you ever call somebody by a nickname so much that you don't remember their, their real name? And in SAS, that is the case. I know 30 people at SAS and I could not tell you 29 nine of them's real name. I know them <laughs> by their alias, you know, uh, engine rider and uh, tramp and pronghorn patty. All those people I know by their, their alias, I don't know that I could pick out their name. You know, that's, that's the crazy thing is I'll have somebody want to friend me on Facebook and I'll say, who the heck is this trying to friend me? And I'll look at pictures of, well, I know them, you know, that's Arizona Rick or that's, you know, <laughs> that's so-and-so. So uh, it, it is, you know, it's just another way of having fun. Yep. Well, I, I'm really intrigued by this and we've talked before. Next time I get out there, we were uh, going to go rattlesnake hunting and now I guess I'm going to, you're going to have to drag me to a SAS match. So uh, as we talked about before, SASnet, that's S-A-S-S-Net.com. And that's the Single Action Shooting Society website. And Alan Choya Garbers, I really appreciate you taking time and probably getting me involved in yet another hobby that I'll have to spend money and go do stuff. But it sounds like it might be a, a, a whole big bunch of fun. Oh, yeah, but surely would enjoy this as well. So, yeah. <laughs> Anytime you want to come out and try it, you come on out. Excellent. Well, thanks for talking to us. No problem. Thank you. I'm currently planning on taking Alan up on his offer to join him for a match, so you'll probably see some interesting video of a rank amateur trying to cowboy up. So stay tuned. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first in the business, and we're always bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments about the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory, YouTube, and of course, gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com and AmericanCop.com. We'd also appreciate it if you'd share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. And don't forget to check out the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, 1791 Gun Leather. Visit them at 1791gunleather.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Partner. Partner.